Hello, and welcome to the second event in the system stream of the 2022 Healthy Working Lives Seminar Series. My name is Professor Alex Polly from the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash University. I will be your MC for today's event and also one of the speakers, so you'll be hearing a little bit from me. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of countries throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. I'm joining you from the lands of the Kulin Nation. In this transition seminar series, we're describing findings from our transition study, which is one of the large studies we're leading here at the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash University. We've had one seminar so far covering the results of the first report from the study, which was in May. You can see that online. And there'll be one more free seminar in this stream on August the 11th, which will coincide with the release of our third report. Today, our seminar is titled Hospital Admissions After Long Duration Workers' Compensation Claims. You'll be hearing a bit from me, giving some background to the study. And then you'll also hear from my colleague, Dr. Daniel Griffiths, also from Monash University, who will describe the findings of our, of our, uh, of our second report from the study. Now, Daniel is a postdoctoral research fellow in the Healthy Working Life Research Group here. His research focuses on improving the quality of life, well-being, and health of workers. Daniel's research encompasses longitudinal cohort studies, investigating health impacts of work loss during the COVID-19 pandemic, and studies on the health and mobility of older Australians. His areas of interest cover approaches to manage workers' mental health and evaluating the health consequences of the pandemic response, including lockdowns, returning to work, and COVID-19 testing and vaccination. Now, there'll be a Q&A at the end of the session, but throughout the seminar, you can submit questions via the Ask a Question button below your live stream. Now, I am going to begin by giving some background to the transition study and providing an overview of the first set of findings from the study. I'll then hand over to Daniel to present our findings on hospital admissions. So the title of the study, uh, Hospital Admissions and Emergency Department Presentations After Long Duration Workers' Compensation Claims. I'd like to uh, acknowledge the large number of people and organisations who are involved in this study. Um, as will become apparent during my presentation and Daniel's, this is a very large undertaking that has involved a collation of information and data from lots of different sources in New South Wales and around Australia. We have a, a, a large and very experienced research team of people from Monash University and from the Institute of Work and Health in Canada. And we've been fortunate enough to have the support of lots of different organisations to help us with our data linkage and access to data. I particularly like to um, acknowledge the contributions of CIRA, the State Insurance Regulatory Authority of New South Wales, who provided both funding and data for the study, and also a range of other organisations who've helped us with data linkage, data storage, or access to data. You can find a lot more information uh, about our study in a few different places. We have published a study protocol, which is available in the International Journal of Population Data Science. There's a link to it here on your screen. Uh, we also, a month or so ago, we presented the findings of the first report of the study, which you can find uh, on the Monash, on our site on Monash University or through this link here. And late, from later on today, you'll be able to find the report, the, find the uh, second report from our study also on our webpage and I provided a link here as well. We'll be circulating this, uh, uh, this presentation to people who are attending the seminar later today. But if you're, if you're looking for them, if you type in Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash University into Google, you'll be able to navigate your way to these reports from the transition study. So a couple of years ago, we published um, an analysis of all of the different sources of income support for people in Australia during period of work disability or work incapacity. So when people have a health condition that limits their ability to participate in paid employment. And we described uh, what we call sort of complex and fragmented 
if you like, a jigsaw uh, approach that we have in Australia where people may access one of any number of different sorts of income support during a period of work disability. Um, today, we're really focusing on workers' compensation and what we have seen over the last decade in Australia is um, in a number of jurisdictions, in, including in New South Wales, the one we're going to speak about specifically today, has been a movement um, towards uh, what we call short tail workers' compensation schemes or time limiting the um, duration for which workers can receive income support through workers' compensation systems. Um, and one of the questions we're asking in the transition study is what happens when that income support stops? Um, in our first seminar, which I'll briefly recap um, in a second, um, we described the, the proportion of people who move from workers' compensation benefits onto Centrelink benefits. But we also have questions about the health of those people. And today we're going to be speaking specifically about hospitalisation and in future we'll talk about other forms of healthcare as well. So this is really the, the critical uh, question on the transition study is what happens when people who are involved in workers' compensation when their income support stops. Now, we can think of a number of different options um, in terms of their income and, and benefits that they may receive. People may return to work and earn wages. That's one possibility. And obviously that's the best outcome, one that we, we hope for. They may transition from one source of income support to another source of income support, such as Centrelink through things like JobSeeker or the Disability Support Pension. And in the first report of our study, we did demonstrate that a large proportion of people do make that transition from workers' compensation support when they have long duration claims onto some form of Centrelink payment. Or they may seek or use some alternative form of financial support, such as relying on income from their partner or family, their own assets or savings, or, or something else like life insurance or another uh, income benefit scheme. When it comes to healthcare and health, what we tend to see in Australian workers' compensation schemes is that people remain eligible for medical and treatment expenses funded by workers' compensation for a period of time after their income benefits end. It's usually for about one year, um, in New South Wales, um, in the cohort we're most interested in for this study, it's between two and five years, depending on uh, the assessed capacity of the person, so how severely incapacitated uh, um, the system judges them to be. What we haven't really been able to focus on until now, um, because we're linking data from other sources, is to look at healthcare that's provided and funded by other systems, such as by Medicare, or funded through our public hospital system, that's been a big gap in knowledge. And we can see uh, when, for instance, people are hospitalised and that's funded by a workers' compensation scheme, but we know that people who make workers' compensation claims have other health conditions as well, um, and we've been blind to the services that they might receive um, funded by other systems that aren't covering their um, compensable injury or condition. So this is really what we're trying to look at in the transition study. Our broad question is what happens to workers with long duration workers' compensation claims when their workers' compensation benefits stop? And more specifically, we're looking at this thing called the Section 39 legislative amendments, which occurred in New South Wales. And we're looking at what happened to people whose income benefits stopped when those amendments came into force, um, both in terms of their income support and their health care. And today we're going to be talking about their health care. So you might be asking yourself at this point, what were those legislative amendments? Um, well, they were a complex set of, uh, they, they came into being as part of a, a complex set of changes to the workers' compensation legislation in New South Wales, introduced through the Workers' Comp Legislation Amendment Act in 2012. And the legislation was amended in response to the workers' compensation system finding itself in a declining financial position. The actuaries of the scheme, uh, independent actuaries projected at the time, uh, future, uh, the, the scheme had a $4.1 billion unfunded liability and that the increase in employer premiums that would be required to cover that liability was 28%, which is obviously a pretty significant increase. So this led to a major scheme reform. There were many changes made to the scheme um, in order to reduce the scheme expenditure and contain costs. Uh, these, I guess, really formed two major buckets of changes. One was restricting eligibility to the scheme. And in a prior paper, 
in the journal Occupational Environmental Medicine, we assessed some of those changes to eligibility uh, rules in New South Wales and, and demonstrated that, yes, many fewer people actually entered the scheme uh, after these legislative changes were brought into, into, into place. Um, scheme reforms also include changes to ac in access to benefits and funding for services. And it's really one of those major components of changes in access to benefits that we're, we're focusing on for this study, and particularly, um, I think it was section 39 of that act, where from December 2012, all income support was capped at 260 weeks maximum duration. There were some exemptions for workers whose whole person impairment was considered to be greater than 20%. And for some people employed in some occupations, such as firefighters, paramedics, police officers, and, and coal miners. The consequence of the Section 39 of the Act was that from, from five years later, from late 2017, income support benefits stopped for, for a group of about 4,000 people who had been receiving those benefits for at least five years, um, many of them for, for much longer than that. And as I said, access to healthcare continued for between two and two and five years. So it's this group of people, this group of roughly 4,000 people who we're very interested in, in this study, in understanding what happened to those people once their workers' compensation benefits stops. Where did they get their income from? What happened to them in terms of hospitalisation and other healthcare services? Um, so here's a, a slide that we put together to try to illustrate um, um, this a bit more simply. So if you think about a worker who had a, an injury at work and had a claim accepted before December 2012, before this legislative reforms really came into effect, they would have received the pre-reform benefits and services that were available in the workers' compensation scheme prior to that date. And then we see the reforms coming into effect in 2012. Um, and from that point forward, we, we know that there was going to be a maximum of 260 weeks of further income support for that, for that person. During that period of time, the system did set up a transitional um, income support, which for most workers was higher than the amount of income support that they were receiving pre-reform for that 260-week period. But then from late 2017, this large group of people, income support stops. And the question we have is well, what happens after that point in time for those people? And particularly what happens to these things, income support, hospitalisation, healthcare use and medicines use. Now, that's a challenging uh, question to answer on a large group of people distributed across a, a population, across a large geographic area um, with very long duration claims. And we had a few options, I guess, about how we we could seek to, to answer those, those questions. One option would have been to follow those people up with a survey-based sort of method and ask them about um, their current circumstances. We, we didn't really think that was feasible um, for a whole variety of reasons, not least of which just the practicalities of getting in touch with everyone and the privacy issues associated with doing that. So what we have chosen to do is to conduct a data linkage study where we have linked data across state and Commonwealth health and income support data sets. So this includes uh, workers' compensation data during the course of the person's workers' compensation claim. And we've been through a process of linking those data on a case-by-case -case basis with a number of other data sets that we know exist in the, in the state of New South Wales or nationally. And these include data on health service use through the Medicare benefit schedule, um, on medicines through pharmaceutical benefit scheme, on social security income support payments through Centrelink, and most relevant for today's presentation on hospital admissions and emergency department presentations through New South Wales State Department of Health. Uh, we don't have time to describe the sort of process we go through to link these cases. Needless to say, we achieved a very strong linkage with um, over 95% of the cases provided to us by the workers' compensation regulator being able to be linked to these other data sets. So we have near population coverage in, in this group of people um, with these other data sets. And importantly, we link the data for a period of time after their claim ends. And that allows us to look at um, what happened using these other data sources when their income support stops. Now, if you logged in 
about a month ago and listened to our first um, presentation in this seminar series, um, this slide might be familiar to you. In that first presentation, we really focused on what happened to people's income support when their workers' compensation benefits stopped. And this is sort of one slide that really summarises what happened in that Section 39 group. What we're showing uh, on this graph on the, the x-axis along the bottom, the, the, the dotted line indicates the point in time at which a person's workers' compensation benefits end. end. Prior to that, left of that, we're seeing what sources of Centrelink income support this group of people were receiving in the year before their workers' compensation benefits end. And on the right, what sorts of income support people were receiving in the year after in terms of the proportion of people in this Section 39 group. And you can see there's a pretty dramatic change um, in that proportion and in the types of income support people are receiving at the time their workers' compensation benefits end. And people are most likely to move on to the new start allowance in red, which is unemployment benefits. The next largest category is the disability support pension in blue. Um, and then we also see benefits such as age pension and carer payments and, and a few other um, income payments that people would access. And around about by 12 months um, post workers' compensation benefits cessation, around about 50% of people are receiving some form of Centrelink benefit, which is a big increase from what we were seeing in the year prior. It's also important to note that another 50% of people were receiving no income support payment from Centrelink. Um, and it's possible that those people had returned to work or were and were receiving wages or that they were relying on some other source of income as I described previously. So this is the major finding from our first study. There is a big transition of people from workers' compensation benefit receipt onto Centrelink payments when their workers' compensation benefits cease under Section 39 of the Legislative Amendments. Um, I'll just wrap up with, for me with a couple of um, pieces of context before I hand over to Daniel, who's going to take us through our results on hospitalisation. There's, there's two things I'd really like to emphasise. One is that in this study, we have three groups of people. We have the Section 39 group, which I've mentioned quite a lot. Now, they're people aged between 18 and 67 years when the income support ended. They've had a workers' compensation claim accepted, um, some of them from as far back as the 1990s, and that closed between late 2017 and early 2018. And we know those people have had at least 260 weeks of income support, many of them much longer terms of periods of income support under workers' compensation. We also have what we've called an injured control group. So these are people who are also of that same age range, who also have an accepted workers' compensation claim in New South Wales, also lodged um, potentially from back in the 90s through up to 2018. Um, but and also has a long duration of um, time on income support payments. And in fact, they have at least 104 weeks of um, time receiving income support. Um, but their income support ended for some other reason. So they're not a, a member of the Section 39 group. They're a comparator group, if you like, of people with long duration workers' compensation claims. And then we have a third group, which we've called the community control group, who are matched to our Section 39 group on their age, their sex, and where they live in New South Wales. Um, these people are residents of New South Wales. They're also aged between 18 and 67, 67 at the point in time that most of the Section 39 amendments came into effect in December 2017. And importantly, we know they're not a member of the other two groups. So these are, if you like, our, our normal community comparison group, which allows us to figure out how different what we're seeing is in the Section 39 group and also in the engine control group. Um, oops, apologise, I've skipped right through to the end. <laughs> One more slide from me. Um, is, now here's the other piece of context that I just wanted to provide before handing over to Daniel, which is about the study period. So I've already mentioned this briefly. We have the period before workers' compensation benefits end, which we will call the pre-index period in a lot of the... Um, information you're about to hear. And we have the 12 month period after workers' compensation benefits end, which we'll call the post-index period. So if you hear those terms as we go, that's what it means. The year before workers' compensation benefits stopped, 
and the year after, pre-index and post-index. So now I'm going to hand over to Daniel, who will take us through um, the new findings on hospitalization. Over to you. Thank you, Alex. I'll be talking about the results from this second report of the transition study about emergency department presentations and inpatient hospital admissions. So this second report had four different research questions that focused on those three study groups. The first one was what proportion of people that were affected by the Section 39 legislative changes presented to an emergency department in the year before their income benefits stopped and the year after. We also looked at differences in the types of emergency department presentations of members of that group during the year before and after the income support payments ended. And a similar pair of questions there at the end, which refer to inpatient hospital admissions. So across the three study groups, what were the differences in the incidence of hospital admissions in the pre-index and post-index period? And also some information about the types of um, hospital admissions or the reasons for being admitted to hospital across those three study groups and two time periods. So we know that changes in income and income support may influence um, individuals' health. So it made sense to look at changes in health um, before and after income support payments uh, stopped uh, across uh, groups of people with long duration workers compensation claims and hospitalization data is one way to gain some insights into those changes. So this report focuses on hospital data across two different types of data sets which are uh, separated into emergency care and inpatient hospital admissions. So the emergency department presentations data set contains information within that part of the hospital system. There are a range of different types of uh, presentations included in that data set. And we've selected uh, a set of rules to define an outcome measure which are listed here below. So firstly, we required emergency department presentations to be unscheduled, so not a pre-planned visit for somebody following up from say a previous presentation or receiving ongoing outpatient care. We're describing ED presentations as an unscheduled visit. Presentations also include people that turned up at ED. They went to the desk, registered that they they presented to the emergency department. And if they decided to wait and the wait got too long and they decided to leave before being triaged, we also include those as an emergency department presentation. Some people are transferred from one ED to another ED or have um, multiple records for something we consider as a single presentation. Uh, we've combined them together into a single presentation. So in a rural area, you might have a road ambulance and an air ambulance. Quite often that's separated into two different records or people may be transferred from one ED to another ED for an ambulance. Uh, we consider that as a single uh, event, a single emergency department presentation event. Now for hospital admissions data is typically recorded in something called episodes of care. And we've created a definition of a period of care, which is when you're admitted into the hospital system until you're discharged from the hospital system or have some other outcome. So within our definition of this, transfers between wards or hospital are considered a single period of care. In the data sets that are commonly reported, they're a bit more fragmented into a different episodes. So a change in ward or a change in the type of patient you're considered in hospital, say from a rehabilitation type of patient or acute or pre or post-pregnancy or something like that. That's multiple records. We've considered it as a single record. Also transfers between hospitals, we consider a single event. So what we report as an inpatient hospital admission is when you enter the hospital system and when you leave. This includes same day admissions, so admissions that last a single day or less. So 
admissions that start and end on the same date, and also admissions that last much longer periods of time. Sometimes these are excluded in hospital reporting systems, the single day and overnight, uh, oh, the single day admissions are excluded in reporting systems. We've decided to keep them in. The outcome measures for each of these data sets are listed here. Firstly, we looked at the number of emergency department presentations per 100 people in a given study group. So that was carried out for each study group individually, and also for each of the two study periods, the before and after, the pre-index, post-index periods. One thing we notice is that ED presentations and hospital admissions are relatively uncommon if you think about how many times you might present to ED or be admitted to hospital in a given year. Um, many people uh, do not do that. And there are a small proportion of people that do that fairly regularly if you have a particular health condition or ill health. So the second outcome measure listed there is whether a person has presented to ED on at least one occasion or not. That was considered a useful um, outcome for this study. For the hospital admissions data, we separated the data set into two broad categories based on single day hospital admissions and those that last longer than one day. Uh, this was important um, to, to identify things, different types of hospital admissions. So overnight ones may point to specific types of uh, illness or types of care required and same day may have another set of care things that are potentially less severe. Uh, so we looked at those separately and that's a common thing that's done by um, departments of health or other hospital reporting systems to separate them based on that uh, metric. Similarly to the ED data, we looked at the number of hospital admissions or periods of care per 100 people in each study group and across each 12 month period. Secondly, we looked at whether some whether anyone had a hospital admission or not during any given year. And thirdly, within the hospital admissions data set, there is a reason for the visit or a, a list of diagnoses of which one is the primary reason. This doesn't describe what happened in hospital, but describes a category of uh, disease or the nature of the visit with a ICD-10 code, the International Classification of Diseases 10th edition code. We chose to look at chapter categories. They can be something like musculoskeletal and connective tissue disease. That would be a reason for, at a chapter level or mental health disorder at a chapter level. And we also looked at a bit more detailed level, a three level code, which say for the mental health category might be something like depression or stress disorder. So it has, we have slightly more specific information and also quite a broad description of the nature of inpatient admissions in the hospital data set. Some of this follows on from, from um, what Alex has described and the previous reports. We first collected long duration workers' compensation claims from CIRA, the, uh, the regulator of the workers' compensation system in New South Wales for two of the study groups. There was a series of criteria um, that going into too much detail, we required the people to satisfy the definitions of the study group. So the section 39 members were flagged about a year in advance of that legislation kicking in. Some of them didn't attain the full 260 weeks and others received payments uh, during our follow-up period. So we required that one year period post workers' compensation to look at our outcomes. So some people were excluded for that reason. In the injured control group, there's a bit more attrition. So we have an extra rule in addition to satisfying that um, two year claim length for that group and the one year follow-up period. We also required these people to have their claims end prior to 2012. So as well as the changes to the workers' compensation system, in 2012 in New South Wales. There are also changes to the Centrelink um, eligibility rules. A range of things were happening around that time that link directly to the outcomes in this study. So we see a bit more attrition in that group, removing some of those older claims. For this report, we required people to be linked to one of two data, say, 
data sets, either the emergency department data set or the admitted patient data set. So that left us with two different cohorts or samples of people that were linked to either or all the other one. Um, I guess the major point here is that we're left with substantial numbers to make um, comparisons between each of the three study groups. The results are going to be presented like this. The three study groups there as in the bar chart, the Section 39 group with five year plus claims, the injured control group with two year plus claims, and the community control across the year before workers' compensation income benefits ended and the year after in the post-index period. The major difference that you can see in that bar chart is compared to the community control group that have around 35 emergency department presentations per 100 people in that group, you can see that the numbers are highest for the Section 39 group and then also more elevated for the injured control group compared to the community control group. So there's large differences there between each of the three study groups. And we can see some slightly more subtle differences from the year before income benefits end and the year after income benefits end from the workers' compensation system. So there on the right, you see there's a statistic after adjusting for a range of demographic covariates, we can measure that emergency department presentations are more common for the two injured groups, the section 39 and the injured control group compared to the community. Another notable difference after adjusting for those demographic factors is that the within the injured control group, there's a decrease from the pre-index period to the post-index period, whereas in the community and the section 39 group, we see an increase so that overall relative decrease whilst comparing to the community control group is a significant one. So the injured control group are presenting to ED less often after income benefits stop compared to before. And that pattern uh, is not significant in the Section 39 group. Across all of the groups, we identified some indicators associated with the having greater odds of presenting to an emergency department in a year. Some of these may be unsurprising that people aged 65 years or older are likely to be presenting at ED. You'll see single parents compared to people with partners and children, people that are not owning their home also more likely to present to ED, people living outside a major city. These are pieces of information that are not typically captured either by the hospital system or the workers' compensation system necessarily, um, but having the data link to the center link uh, information, we're able to identify some indicators that may be relevant to the workers' compensation system to identify um, characteristics associated with ill health or hospital service use. We also see that people that were transitioned to Centrelink income support payments after workers' compensation ends, or were at least receiving Centrelink in that post-index period, were also more likely to be presenting to an emergency department. You can see that the odds were highest for the people on the disability support pension. Perhaps unsurprising given the um, how eligibility is assessed for that in terms of people having to attain a certain number of impairment points. You can also see that presenting to ED was more common for people on the job seeker allowance, the new start allowance, and other working age payments from Centrelink. And those are compared to people that were not receiving Centrelink uh, in the same period of time. The hospital admissions data, you see that in the community group around 46 to 47 people were admitted to hospital per 100 people in the group. In the community control, you can see that the rates are higher for the Section 39 group and for the injured control group. The Section 39 group, they increase here from the pre-index period to the post-index period and are at a similar level in the pre-index period for the injured control group at around 68 uh, admissions. 
So the overall trend here is that hospital admissions are more common for both the Section 39 and the injured control groups compared to the community control group. And you can see in the middle there that um, being admitted to hospital was significantly more common in the pre-index period than for the post-index period for the injured control group. So you see that decrease in the injured control group and a small increase in prevalence, at least for the Section 39 group. So those are all hospital admissions, um, single day and overnight. After adjusting for a range of covariates, on the left there, there's an odds ratio graph. You can see that the Section 39 group across the pre-index and post-index period, they're relatively similar. And you can see that the odds for the injured control group decrease from the pre-index period to the post-index period. So you see fewer overnight hospital admissions there for the injured control group. We also see a number of indicators like the ED presentation data associated with lower odds of an overnight hospital admission. So those hospital admissions that result in uh, a longer period of care. They were people that were relatively young, uh, being aged 20 to 44 compared to older people, people that were born overseas and living outside a major city. Indicators associated with greater odds of an overnight hospital admission were people receiving the disability support pension in the post-index period, and that was quite significant. The, um, looking at the primary diagnosis or reason for being admitted to hospital for a, a single day admission, we can see that musculoskeletal diseases were very common for members of the Section 39 group, corresponding with a common reason for um, having a workers' compensation claim in that group. We also saw that there were a higher percentage of men mental and behavioral disorders in the Section 39 group and the injured control groups compared to community levels, and that some of those remained elevated in the year after workers' compensation income pay benefits ended. So on the right there, I listed some of the most common primary conditions for the Section 39 group. So these are at the three digit level, the more specific diagnostic information. See the common reasons there vary. Uh, we see the back pain, spine pain, uh, most common perhaps relating directly to the compensable injury that they're receiving workers' compensation for. We can see that there's inpatient same day admissions for depressive episodes and reaction to stress. And we also see a range of other things that other aftercare that may relate to a previous hospital admission, uh, osteoarthritis, anorexia and dialysis. Dialysis being something that would make sense given that that's a, a reoccurring or regular type of treatment. So taking together this, a range of reasons why this group will be um, receiving hospital care, some will relate directly or uh, indirectly to a compensable injury or the workers' compensation claim, and others are uh, unre unrelated to that. For overnight hospital admissions, there's some subtle differences, but we still see that musculoskeletal disease is the most common reason for an, a longer hospital admission in the Section 39 group. We see a reduction in admissions for that reason in the injured control group in the post-index period. We don't have information about why those long claims ended in that group, but it may correspond to rehabilitation and return to work for some people in that injured control group. We see that there's a high percentage of musculoskeletal conditions in the Section 39 group and the injured control group compared to the community. And in terms of the nature of injury, some of those are the same as in the single day admission list. We also see some more potentially severe things like a heart attack, throat and chest pain are common reasons that members of the Section 39 group will be admitted to longer hospital stays. We also looked at some changes in admissions to either a public hospital or a private hospital. Um, this doesn't refer to the patient type, it refers to the hospital type. 
And uh, here you can see overall in the section of the deny group and the injured control group from the pre-index to post-index, you can see the blue bar is slightly larger, the green is slightly lower. So we're seeing a decrease in the use of private hospital services after income uh, benefits end in those two groups with long duration claims, even though the, the change at that point is to the income benefits provided by the workers' compensation system, we're seeing differences in admissions to the percentage of admissions to private hospitals as well across those two study periods. So some conclusions so that injured workers with long duration claims are significantly more likely to present to an emergency department or be admitted to short or long hospital stays than people in the community. And that this persists after income benefits end. Whilst we see a reduction in some of those outcome measures for the injured control group, uh, others remain at, a, remain at the similar rate for the section 39 group after income benefits end due to that duration limit. And some other key findings are that musculoskeletal and mental health conditions were the most common diagnoses linked to the hospital use, reflecting uh, for some the compensable injury. And to note that there are a range of other reasons why people with long duration claims are being admitted to hospital. And given that they uh, have a long duration claim, they're getting older and may also be experiencing age related health declines. Some of the implications of looking at hospital data and linking that to workers' compensation records are demonstrate the importance of transitional arrangements for healthcare after um, workers' compensation stop funding income support payments or income benefits, and to ensure effective communication about the continuation of healthcare entitlements after income benefits stop. When looking at this and taking this data into context, it's important to understand that non-compensable health conditions are also common reasons why people are, receive hospital care, both during a claim and after claims, uh, after income benefits end. Given the relatively high levels of mental health uh, admissions to hospital for mental health problems in the two injured, injured groups, it points to the the additional need of mental health supports both at, towards the end of long claims and soon after. Given some of the conclusions and findings, we, we can see that having a long duration claim is, uh, is not, a, not a great outcome. So the importance for and that in terms of health and uh, future welfare, in terms of transitions to Centrelink and things from the, uh, from the first report of the transition study as well, so just a reminder that there, there's an important objective here to prevent these very long claims as early on as possible and to promote rehabilitation and return to work where appropriate and possible. Uh, some of the strengths of the transition study are this long time series and large sample size. We can answer some questions that the workers' compensation system or no other single agency can through that linkage process. We have a community control group uh, to compare uh, differences between people without the injury and a long claim. And we also have data about healthcare services that are not necessarily funded by the workers' compensation insurers and a range of other uh, potential indicators which uh, workers' compensation systems um, may wish to capture in the future if that's useful to assist with rehabilitation and return to work outcomes. What's next? There's been two reports at the moment from this study. One is available on the web page. The other one will be available today about this talk. And there's a future seminar coming up on the 11th of August about uh, non-hospital healthcare and uh, with Dr. Michael Di Donato. I encourage uh, people watching to also tune into that. Uh, thank you to the team of people that put this study and this report together listed there, and again, to acknowledge the support and data from the State Insurance Regulatory Authority of uh, New South Wales. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your attention. We'll be back in a moment with a 
question and answer session. So please send through any questions you have for us. Thank you. Well, welcome back and thank you, Daniel, for a wonderful uh, presentation of the findings of our second report. Um, it's time now for a question and answer session. We've had a number of questions submitted, um, which we'll work through. I guess just being you and I, Daniel, we'll be sort of talking to ourselves, but uh, that's okay. Um, we'll try to reflect um, as much as we can um, different perspectives. And just remind that um, if people are still watching, they can submit um, questions by the um, button on their screen below, below um, the view that you're looking at. Um, so, Daniel, I'll start with a question for you, if I can, um, which is, why do you think we're seeing the injured control group improving in terms of having a reduction in emergency department visits and hospital presentations um, after the end of income benefits stop? And we see the opposite pattern in the Section 39 group. There are either remaining the same or getting a bit, bit worse. What do you think um, some of the reasons for that are? Mm. We, we know that the, the people whose income benefits ended under Section 39 have done so. Um, we know that those people have not returned to work before that duration cutoff has come into place. And, I think if, and we know that the injured control group have long claims that have ended for other reasons and that one of those reasons is return to work. We're not sure exactly how many, what proportion of those people have returned to work, um, but it's an outcome I think would that would be more likely than people attaining a duration cap on their workers' compensation income benefits. I think that's probably the primary reason why we see a reduction in health service use, um, using that as a proxy, really rough proxy for health, health status. If people are healthier, they'll be using uh, less hospital services overall so the yep. section 39 group are likely to continue to um, maintain a similar health status or have changes in health that do not reflect sort of the improvement levels observed in the other group i think that's probably the main yeah the no main i agree reason. i think i think the change in the injured control group you know at least part of that uh, explanation for that is what we know about the health benefits of work and you know, we know that a, it's most likely that a, a proportion of people in that injury control group actually return to work, and that's why their benefits stop. Not all of them, of course, but um, more of them than in the Section 39 group. And, and the know, other we thing know, we, know we know that in the Section 39 group, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I think question. you're going to talk about <laughs> transitions to Centrelink. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. So the other thing we know in the Section 39 group is that um, many of them moved on to a level other onto no other form of income support, at least that we could match, um, we could identify, sorry, or onto a level of income support like unemployment benefits or the DSP, which is likely to be much lower than what they were receiving in terms of financial support when they were on workers' comp. So um, there's probably an extra element of something like financial stress, which we know can affect people's health um, in many ways. So, that's another, uh, really, I guess what I'm saying is it probably reflects what we know about the social determinants of health, things like work being good for your health and being in financial distress being bad for your health. It's really sort of coming through in that pattern that we're observing. Yeah, exactly. Especially for those people on the lower rates of the unemployment um, unemployment benefit from Centrelink job seeker new start. Sort of related to something you mentioned just then in your answer was um, another question, which is about hospitalizations for um, mental illness. And uh, you sort of spoke about it, but we didn't see specifics. I know the specifics in the report, but um, the question is how much how much higher? So what was what was the percentage of hospitalizations for mental disorders in um, people in those long duration claim groups? And and are these funded by workers' comp or funded by someone else, like a public healthcare system or, or something else? Um, for, the, for the first part, um, 
mental health admissions to the hospital are relatively uncommon or rare overall. I think some of them will be captured in the emergency department data, but for the inpatient hospital data, I think the community levels were around 5%, 2 to 5% of um, all hospital admissions were for uh, mental related disorder was the primary reason. And I think in the injured groups, that was around 15%, so around three, three to four times higher. And there was a decrease after workers' compensation income benefits ended for the injured control group, but it remained more or less the similar level for the Section 39 group. So there's quite the relative difference there between the community group and the injured groups are is, um, yeah, around three to four times more common to go to hospital for a mental-related um, problem. Yeah, which is obviously a a pretty significant difference. Um, I mean, overall, hospital admissions were about roughly 50% more common in those mm -hmm. injured control groups. But of those, we're seeing three to four times as many admissions for mental health, for mental disorders than we are in the, in the community. So yeah. I mean, that's quite a significant effect. And there was a similar pattern for musculoskeletal conditions as well, wasn't there? Just a much mm -hmm. higher prevalence yep. of admissions um, for musculoskeletal disorders in the two injured groups compared to the community control group. Yeah, yeah, that's right. There was, yeah, yeah, there's some other differences between the community groups um, in terms of serious mental illness that came through. So they're, they're less likely to potentially be in work or um, to receive a workers' compensation claim. So there's a very small group of people with severe mental illness. But what we see in the injured groups are um, something slightly different. Overall prevalence of ill mental health potentially leading to hospitalization is more common. Which reflects what we know about um, people with workers' compensation claims generally. I mean, we've got other studies which show a higher prevalence of things like psychological distress or symptoms of anxiety and depression in people who have physical injury claims in a workers' comp scheme, much higher than what we would see in a community-based sample anyway. I guess what we're seeing now with this study is that also translates to a much higher proportion of people being hospitalised for those, those mental mm -hmm. health conditions, not just reporting that they have symptoms, which is an important additional yeah, finding, I think. Yeah, that's right. When people experiencing this quite often, you know, first stage might be sort of self-management of stress and issues or seeking uh, talking to a GP or a psychologist when people reach the enter the hospital admissions data set quite often that's sort of at the pointy end of healthcare where things are relatively severe yeah yeah um, so here's an interesting question um, we'll see how we can manage this one which is so what if we, I, I talked a bit about short tail, and I'm paraphrasing the question here, about short difference between short tail and long tail workers' compensation schemes. And we have seen this movement in Australia over the last decade or so towards reforming schemes so that there are more short tail schemes, like I guess the one that we're describing here. Um, so the question is really what are the impacts of that on other systems of funding healthcare like Medicare? private health insurers, you know, state-based hospital systems. Um, there is, I guess that's a, really that's a question about shifting costs from one system to another. Uh, uh, mm. uh, is one of the effects of changing uh, benefits services available through a workers' comp system, actually having a flow on impact to other um, health funding systems? Hmm. Yeah, that's a difficult question. I think in terms of income support, that's sort of what report one looks at quite directly. The, in, the employer is eventually stopped paying the wage. The workers' compensation pays the income support payment or in wage replacement payments. And then Centrelink picks up the bill after that ends for a proportion of people with um, long claims particularly those we've looked at over those time periods for their healthcare. I guess what we're seeing is that there's a 
continued need for more hospital care compared to the community group or an uninjured population. So the healthcare need continues after income benefits stop. Um, if we were to look further down the line at those after the two to five years healthcare coverage ends in terms of not just hospital healthcare services, um, I think we're likely to still see an elevated need for healthcare by those people. Um, so yeah, I think Medicare and private health insurers will be um, covering those excess hospitalizations uh, for people under the short tail short tail schemes there are obviously people that can continue beyond the people that are assessed as being very incapacitated or reaching thresholds above a certain level to be eligible for long tail coverage but for those people in the short tail scheme yeah that uh, medicare would be or private health insurance things yeah. other funding sources for healthcare will be uh, picking up those costs that some yeah. of which would otherwise be funded through longer tail schemes. Yeah. And I think this is an opportunity also just to give a plug for the next seminar um, and the next report from this study where that's actually something we do look at specifically, which is who's funding things like primary health care and physical therapy and psychological therapy in these groups. So I won't give away the answer to that question, but we, we do examine that question. Um, and finally, we've just got a minute or two to go. Um, there's a question about you know, whether we would expect to see similar patterns of use in other states and territories. Um, so I guess would, would emergency department and hospital admission data um, before and after end of benefits look the same in, if we weren't looking in New South Wales, would it be the same in Queensland and Western Australia, and Victoria and other places? Yeah. The I guess this study focuses specifically on the Section 39 group, and that is fairly unique to New South Wales. Um, other workers' compensation schemes are slightly less generous, <laughs> so people would not attain claims of that duration even. They're too short to, to reach that phase. Um, without going into the differences of all the different <laughs> types of workers' compensation schemes, I think I think one of the primary things here is if you reach a duration cap and are unable to return to work, there'll be a proportion of people unable to return to work. There's a continued health need there. And um, I think some of those patterns will be uh, reflected in other states and territories. Yeah, I agree. I think clearly what we're demonstrating, particularly in that injury control group, is that there is that ongoing health need, um, although it reduces a bit in that group. Um, you know, um, still the, the proportion of that group or the rate of emergency department presentation and hospital admission, even in that injury control group, is still higher than what we're seeing in the community. So mm, yeah. um, even after income support ends, there's this sort of um, ongoing need that's elevated for hospital care um, in that group. Um, as you say, the Section 39 group is kind of unique, so it's hard to compare that to other states and territories, really. Um, we're sort of out of time, so we might just um, take a, shift, a quick break and we'll be back to wrap up this session in, in just a second. Well, that's it for today. Um, thank you all for attending the seminar. My thanks again to Dr. Daniel Griffith for taking us through the, the findings of that study in such a clear way. Um, if you're interested in more findings from the transition study, we'll be hosting one more free event uh, focusing on findings of our third report, which we expect to release in August. So the uh, event is on Thursday, the 11th of August, 12.30, Australian Eastern, Eastern Standard Time. The title of that event is What Healthcare Do People Receive When Workers' Compensation Ends? And we'll be looking at general practice care, physical therapy, and psychological therapy before and after the end of workers' comp benefits. A speaker there will be Dr. Michael DiDonato, who's been leading that part of the work uh, also from a healthy working large research group here at Monash. And I hope to see you there. Thanks again for, for coming along today. Thank you.